Hi, so this is uh, lecture two for week two. And I am going to try really hard to bring this in um, under the time limit. I can't tell you how hard it is. Um, professors are used to just boring on um, for the entire length of class and to try to get it into eight minutes is kicking my tail. All right, but I've set a timer and I'm really going to work hard on that. So let's get started. The Splendor of Our Public and Common Life. That's the name of the podcast um, that you're listening to for this week in addition to the reading. And the podcast really replay, repays the time you spend listening to it. It's a conversation between an architect and a geographer. And I find both of those disciplines very interesting, but they're not areas where I have a lot of experience myself. My background is in law and in um, cultural analysis and literature. So I was just really interested to see what these two very different um, disciplines might say through their representatives. You know, uh, Kiefer Dunn, the, the architect, and Garrett Dash Nelson, the geographer, they're coming together. And I actually think it would be great if they put a psychiatrist or some other people in there to look at this task, text. Bellamy's looking backward and saying, what is this? And what these two guys come up with is so great. Some of it is absolutely, in my estimation, worth your attention. And some of it, I just want to put, a, you know, just, just put a finger on the pause button here and say, I'm not sure I completely agree. So let's start with some of the stuff they got right. And there's a lot. Um, Garrett Dash Nelson makes the point really quite explicitly that religion and his religious upbringing are what were driving Bellamy's choices and thinking and investments in, um, in the vision he articulates in the book. I don't know about that. Because my sense of it, having read um, some brief and extended biographies of Bellamy is that he was very much influenced by his desire to go to West Point. He studied uh, military leadership and uh, troop movements and generals. And he was a young dude just, you know, in his early teens, um, maybe even younger when the Civil War, the American Civil War broke out. He was still in his teens or a young adult when the Civil War ended in 1865. And so he thought a lot about military service. He got into West Point. It's really hella hard to do. He got in and um, then they, they kicked him out because he had tuberculosis. As somebody who's been coughing a lot, I feel that's an injustice. But um, it put him on the path to a different, a different career. I think a lot of people in my program, which is liberal studies, discover that sometimes when you can't do the thing you first planned on doing, the thing you do instead is sometimes just a better fit for who you are and where you are in life. So he couldn't do West Point and he started thinking to himself, you know, and he was very interested in, in, in still interested in those military structures. And he started to think about what, where do we apply these? And so if you just listen to the podcast, you might come away with a very limited idea of what's going on in the novel with regard to the industrial army. The industrial army is something, is an, is an invention of Bellamy's where he says, let's think about all the work that's happening in factories. It's a golden age of capitalism. And it, I mean, workers are working 15 hour days, little kids, women, people get injured. There's no workers' compensation, no sick leave, no nothing. It's just crazy. Six days a week, um, you know, half a day on Sundays. It's insane. And so um, Bellamy thinks about this and says something really interesting. He says, what if we put together the same discipline and obedience and coordination of military service and we put all the people who are working in industry right now into that military service and we called it industrial army instead of the profits going to these golden you know gilt age capitalists of you know um jp morgan and those big guys in the 1800s um instead of the money going to them it'll go back into the public um coffers and we'll distribute it to everybody everybody gets like a universal basic income you know bellamy doesn't use the words universal basic income but you'll hear that he's describing something like that where everybody gets an allowance and it doesn't matter if you're young old working or not working you've got money coming in and you got choices about where to spend it so i think he does a really i think the the the, the podcast does a really good job of explaining this reality but it doesn't tell 
how that even got started in Bellamy's mind, which I believe had a lot to do with military service. Um, so other things that, that, that are going on in this record, in, in, in this um, podcast that are really great, um, Garrett Dash Nelson says, when you think about how beautiful Boston is in the year 2000 in Bellamy's book, think about a college campus. And I think both um, Garrett Dash Nelson and Bellamy were thinking about something like these big old rich campuses on the Eastern seaboard, like the one that I went to Brown University. Um, gorgeous green spaces, you know, you're walking under these fabulous trees, these brick lined roads, and the buildings are just magnificent. The public space belongs to everybody and everybody feels that they're welcome in the buildings. You know, when you go somewhere, like, I don't know if you've ever been to one of these fancy places, uh, fancy shopping malls, I'll go to like Bal Harbor or I forget the one that's in Midtown now. And I feel like I shouldn't be there. Like I'm not dressed for it. Like they don't want me, you know, but those are, those are, those are public spaces, but they're run for private reasons. When you go to a public space that's run for public reasons, you feel welcome. You walk into a grand museum or a lecture hall or a dining hall with marble floors and wood paneling, and you think, ah, this is mine too. And I think that's, 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 I think this analogy to college campuses is really good. It's really well placed within the podcast. The only thing I'd say is FIU has some of that, but not that much. And that's because we're a commuter campus. And if you consider how, how reasonable the tuition is and how much you get for it, should they also have, you know, Ivy covered brick buildings? Maybe not. FIU all the time, every day, all day. Go Panthers. All right. Last thing I want to point out is that the um, co host and the, um, the guest uh, for the podcast Buildings on Air just go out of their way to crap all over the romance plot for this book. And I put some quotes at the bottom here that I want you to look at because I think that those, those guys kind of missed the point of what Edith Leeds is doing in the story. Not only does she provide a frame for all of the, the um, examples and explanations about the difference between you know, the 18th century, I mean, the 19th century and the 21st century, not only is she doing that, but there's also a chance for the author to really consider women's lives. And there's this fabulous passage in, um, in chapter one that I'm gonna, gonna quote and another passage in, in chapter two about women's bodies and women's clothing. And it does kind of beg the question, what do women wear in a utopia? It's delicious. I mean, is it a utopia if you have to wear a thong? I'm going to say no. Okay, a thong underpant, you know. All right. Last slide, and we are done. Um, there are so many places here when um, in the novel, which I think that that podcast got absolutely right, thinking about how Bellamy does not reject the 20th century um, advancements or 21st century advancements. He's all in, he's in favor of the logistical machine that put together Amazon and he describes it. He's sitting there in, you know, 1800 and something. And he's like, hey, why don't we have something that'll one day look like Amazon? He's really great with that. He's great about thinking about all of the ways that we can take the technology and the innovation of, of a capitalist um, enterprise and use it for the public good. And I have a link here at the bottom to a, um, to a town, Chattanooga, Tennessee, that said, hey, what would happen if instead of letting Mediacom and Comcast provide our internet, we did it ourselves? And so this municipal socialism is something that, um, that I think that the podcast does a great job of pointing our attention to in the text. The last thing I'm gonna say is, neither the podcast nor the novel has given me any indication of how you would get Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, to agree to hand over everything he's, he's got and let all of the proceeds from that enterprise go from his pockets off to the public coffers. So that is like the beginning of, of my sort of early critique um, and my invitation to you to critique what Bellamy's um, saying in the book. There's so much here to like and so much to think more deeply about. Thanks for listening. Oh, man, I went long. Crap a duty. Look, I tried. I tried. I swear I tried. <laughs>